Chapter One of Doctor Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One. It is a sad enough thing at any time for a man to have to confess himself a failure, but I think it will be admitted that it is doubly so at that period of his career. And he is not only young enough to have had some flickering sparks of ambition left, but old enough to appreciate at their proper value the overwhelming odds against which he has been battling so long and with such conspicuously poor success. Such was my case. I had entered the medical profession seemingly with everything in my favour. My father had built up a reputation for himself and, what he prized still more, a competency as a country practitioner of the old-fashioned sort in the west of england i was his only child as he was in the habit of saying he looked to me to carry the family name up to those dizzy heights at which he had often gazed but on which he had never aspired to set his foot a surgeon i was to be willy-nilly it may have been a throwback to the parental instinct alluded to above which led me at once to picture myself flying at express speed regardless of cost across Europe, in obedience to the summons of some potentate whose life and throne depended upon my dexterity and knowledge. In due course I entered a hospital and followed the curriculum in the orthodox fashion. It was not, however, until I was approaching the end of my student days that I was burnt with that fire of enthusiasm which was destined ultimately to consume me altogether. Among the students of my year was a man by whose side I had often worked, with whom I had occasionally exchanged a few words, but whose intimate I could not in any way claim to have been. In appearance, he was narrow-shouldered, cadaverous, lantern-jawed fellow, dark, restless eyes, who boasted the name of Kelleran, and was properly supposed to be an Irishman. As I discovered later, however, he was not an Irishman at all, but hailed from the black country. Wolverhampton, if I remember rightly, being the city which he claimed the honour of his birth. His father had been the senior partner in an exceedingly wealthy firm of hardware manufacturers, and while we had been in the habit of pitying, and in some instances, I'm afraid, of rather looking down on the son on account of his supposed poverty, he was, in all probability, in a position to buy up every other man in the hospital twice over. The average medical student is a being with whom the world in general has by this time been made fairly familiar. His frolics and capacity, or incapacity as you may choose to term it, for work have been the subject of innumerable jests. If this be a true picture, then Kelleran was certainly different to the usual run. In his case, the order was reversed. With him, work was play, and play was work while a jest was a thing unknown and for which he allowed it to be seen that he had not the slightest tolerance i have already said that my father had a master competency i must now add that up to a certain point he was a generous man with my allowance under different circumstances it would have been ample for my requirements as ill luck would have it however i had got into the wrong set and before i had been two years in the hospital was over head and ears in such a quagmire of debt and difficulties that it looked as if nothing but an absolute miracle could serve to extricate me. To my father I dared not apply, easy going as he was in most matters. I had good reason to know that on the subject of debt he was inexorable, and yet to remain in my present condition was impossible. On every side, tradesmen threatened me. My landlady's account had not been paid for weeks while among the men of the hospital not one but several held my paper for sums lost at cards the remembrance of which which sent a cold shiver down my back every time i thought of them from all this it will be surmised that my position was not only one of considerable difficulty but that it was also one of no little danger unless i could find a sufficient sum if not to free myself at least stave off my creditors my career as far as the world of medicine was concerned might be considered at an end 
even now i can recall the horror of that period as vividly as if it were but yesterday it was on a thursday i remember that the thunderclap came on returning to my rooms in the evening i discovered a letter awaiting me trembling fingers i tore open the envelope and drew out the contents as i feared it proved to be a demand from the most implacable creditor a money-lender to whom i had been introduced by a fellow student the sum i had borrowed from him with the assistance of a friend had been only a trifling one but it helped out by fines and other impositions and it had now increased to an amount which i was aware it was hopelessly impossible for me to pay what was i to do what could i do unless i settled the claim the hope for mercy from the man himself was to say the least of it absurd my friend who i happened to know was himself none too well off at the moment would be called upon to make it good after that how should i be able to face him or any one else again i had not a single acquaintance in the world from whom i could borrow a sum that would be half sufficient to meet it while well, i dared not go down to the country and tell my father of my folly and disgrace in vain i ransacked my brains for a loophole of escape then the whistle of a steamer on the river attracted my attention filling my brain with such thoughts that it had never entertained before and i pray by god's mercy may never know again here was a way out of my difficulty if only i had the pluck to try it strangely enough the effect it had upon me was to brace me like a draught of rare wine this was succeeded by a coldness so intense both mind and body were rendered callous by it how long it lasted i cannot say it may have been only a few seconds it may have been an hour before consciousness returned and i found myself still standing beside the table holding the fatal letter in my hand like a drunken man i fumbled my way from the room into the hot night outside what was i going to do i did not exactly know i wanted to be alone in some place away from the crowded pavements if possible where i could have time to think and to determine upon my course of action with a tempest of rage against i knew not what in my heart i hurried along up one street and down another until i found myself panting but unappeased upon the embankment opposite temple gardens all around me were the bustle of life of the great city cabs containing men and women in evening dress dashed along girls and their lovers talking in hushed voices went by me arm in arm even the loafers leaning against the stone parapet seemed happy in comparison with my wretched self i looked down at the dark water gurgling so pleasantly below me and i remembered that all i had to do as soon as i was alone was to drop over the side allow it to engulf me and so be done with my difficulties for ever then in a flash the real meaning of what i proposed to do came to me coward coward i hissed with as much vehemence and horror as if i had been addressing a real enemy instead of myself to think of taking this way out of your difficulty if you kill yourself what will become of the other man go to him at once and tell him everything he has the right to know the argument was irresistible and i accordingly turned my heel i was about to start off in quest of the man i wanted and i found myself confronted with no less a person than kelleran he was walking quickly and swung his cane as he did so on seeing me he stopped douglas ingleby he said well this is fortunate you're just the man i want to see I murmured something in reply, I forget what, and was about to pass on. I'd bargain without my host, however. He had been watching me with his keen dark eyes, and when he made as if he would walk with me, I was not altogether surprised. You don't object to my accompanying you, I hope, he inquired, by the way of introduction of what he had to say. I've been wanting to have a talk with you for some days past. I'm afraid I'm, wrong, uh, I'm afraid I'm in rather a hurry just now, I answered, quickening my pace a little as I did so. That makes no difference to me, he returned. If I think you're aware I'm a fast walker. Since you're in a hurry, let's step out. We did so, and for something like fifty yards I proceeded at a brisk pace in perfect silence. This at last became more than I could stand, and I stopped and faced him. What is it you want with me? I asked angrily. 
cannot you see that i am not well to-night and would rather be alone i can see you're not quite the thing he answered quietly still watching me with his grave eyes this is exactly why i want to walk with you a little cheerful conversation would do you good you don't know how clever i am at adapting my manner to other people's requirements that is the secret of our profession my dear ingleby as you will some day find out i shall never find it out i replied bitterly i have done with medicine i shall clear out of england i think go abroad try australia or canada anywhere i don't care where to get out of this the very thing he replied cheerily but without a trace of surprise you couldn't do better i'm sure you are strong active full of life and ambition and just the sort of fellow in fact to make a good colonist must be a grand life that hewing and hacking a place for oneself in a new country watching and fostering the growth of a nation that may some day take the rank among the powers of the earth ha i like the idea it is grand it is magnificent it makes one tingle to think of it he threw his arms out and squared his shoulders as if he were preparing for the struggle he had so graphically described after that we did not walk quite so fast the man had suddenly developed a strange fascination for me and as he talked i hung upon his words with a feverish interest i can scarcely account for now by the time we reached my lodgings i had forgotten my trouble for the time being when i entered my sitting-room and found the envelope which had contained the fatal letter still lying upon the table it all rushed back upon me and with such force that i was well nigh overwhelmed kelleran meanwhile had taken up his position on the hearth-rug whence he watched me with the same expression of contemplative interest upon his face to which i have before alluded hello he said at last after he had been some minutes in the house and he had begun to overhaul my library what are these where did you pick them up he had taken a book from the shelf and was holding it tenderly in his hand i recognised it as one of several volumes of a sixteenth-century work on surgery that i had chanced upon in a bookstall in holywell street some months before its age and date had interested me and i had bought it more out of curiosity than for any other reason kelleran however could scarcely withdraw his eyes from it it's the very thing i've been wanting to make my set complete he cried after i had described my discovery of it perhaps you don't know it but i'm a perfect lunatic on the subject of books my own rooms where by the by you have never been are crammed from ceiling to floor and still i go on buying let me see what else you have so saying he continued his survey of the room humming softly to himself as he did so and pulling out such books as interested him and heaping them upon the floor you've by no means a bad collection he was kind enough to say when he had finished judging from what i see here you must read a great deal more than most of our men i'm afraid not i answered the majority of these books were sent up to me from the country by my father who thought they might be of service to me a mistaken notion for they take up a lot of room and i've often wished them at hanover you have have you you goth he continued well then i'll tell you what i'll do if you want to get rid of them i'll buy the lot these old beauties included they are really worth more than i can afford but if you care about it i'll make you a sporting offer of a hundred and fifty pounds for such as i put upon the floor what do you say i could scarcely believe i heard aright his offer was so preposterous that i could have laughed in his face my dear fellow i cried thinking for a moment that he must be joking with me and feeling inclined to resent it what nonsense you talk a hundred and fifty for that lot why well, they're not worth a ten pound note all told the old fellows are certainly curious but it's only fair that i should tell you that i gave five shillings and sixpence for the set of seven volumes complete then you got a bargain such as you'll never find again he answered quietly i wish i could make as good an one every day however there's my offer take it or leave it as you please i will give you one hundred and fifty pounds for those books and take my chance of their value if you are prepared to accept i'll get a cab and take them away to-night i've got my cheque-book in my pocket and i'll settle up for them on the spot but my dear kelleran how can you afford to give such here i stopped abruptly i beg your pardon i know i have no right to say such a thing 
don't mention it he answered quietly i'm not in the least offended i assure you i've always felt certain you fellows suppose me to be poor as a matter of fact however i have the good fortune or the ill as i sometimes think to be able to indulge myself to the top of my bent without fear of the consequences but that has nothing to do with the subject at present under discussion will you take my price and let me have the books or not i assure you i'm all anxiety to get my nose inside one of those old covers before i sleep to-night heaven knows i was eager enough to accept if you think for one moment you will see what his offer meant to me with such a sum i could not only pay off the money-lender but well nigh put myself straight with the rest of my creditors yet all the time i had the uneasy feeling that the books were no means worth the amount he had declared to be their value and that he was only making me an offer out of kindness are you sure you mean it oh, i will accept i said i am awfully hard up and the money will be a godsend to me i am rejoiced to hear it he replied for in that case we should be doing each other a mutual good turn now let's get them tied up if you wouldn't mind seeing to it i'll write the cheque and call a cab ten minutes later he and his new possessions had taken their departure and i was once more in my room standing beside the table just as i had done a few hours before but with what a difference then i had seen no light ahead nothing but complete darkness and dishonour now i was a new man and in a position to meet the majority of calls upon me the change from the one condition to the other was more than i could bear and when i remembered that less than sixty minutes before i was standing on the antechamber of death the embankment contemplating suicide i broke down completely and sinking into a chair buried my face in my hands and cried like a child next morning as soon as the bank had opened its doors i entered and cashed the cheque calloran had given me and calling a cab i made my way with a light heart as you may suppose to the office of the money-lender in question his surprise on seeing me and on learning the nature of my errand may be better imagined than described having transacted my business with him i was preparing to make my way back to the hospital when an idea entered my head upon which i immediately acted in something under ten minutes i stood in the bookseller's shop in holywell street where i had purchased the volumes kelleran had appeared to prize so much some weeks ago i said to the man who came forward to serve me i purchased from you an old work on medicine entitled the perfect chirurgeon or the art of healing as practised in diverse ancient countries seven volumes very much soiled five and sixpence returned the man immediately i remember the books i'm glad of that i answered now i want you to tell me what you would consider the real market value of the work if it were wanted to make up a collection it might possibly be worth a sovereign the man replied promptly otherwise not more than we asked you for it then you don't think any one would be likely to offer a hundred and fifty pounds for it i inquired the man laughed outright not a man who has possession of his wits he answered no sir i think i've stated the price very fairly though of course it might fetch a few shillings more or less according to the circumstances i'm very much obliged to you so i said i simply wanted to know as a matter of curiosity with that i left the shop and made my way to the hospital where i found kelleran hard at work he looked up at me as i entered and nodded but it was well nigh lunch time before i got an opportunity of speaking to him Kelleran, i said when i did you deceived me about those books last night they were not worth anything like the value you put on them he looked me full and fair in the face and i saw a faint smile flicker round the corners of his mouth my dear ingleby he said what a funny fellow you are to be sure surely if i choose to give you what i consider the worth of the books i am at perfect liberty to do so and if you are willing to accept it no more need be said upon the subject the value of a thing to a man is what he cares to give for it so i have always been led to believe but i am convinced you did not give it only because you wanted the books you knew i was in straits and you took that form of helping me it was generous of you indeed kelleran and i'll never forget it as long as i live you saved me from but there i cannot tell you i dare not think of it myself but there is one thing i must ask of you I want you to keep the books and to let the amount you gave me for them be a loan, which I will repay as soon as I possibly can. I was aware that he was a passionate man, 
indeed once or twice i had seen him in a rage but never in a greater one than now let it be what you please he cried turning from me only for pity's sake drop the subject i've had enough of it with this explosion he stalked away leaving me standing looking after him divided between gratitude and amazement i have narrated this incident for two reasons in the first place because it will furnish you with a notion of my own character which i am prepared to admit exhibits but few good points and in the second because it will serve to introduce you to a queer individual now a very great person whom i shall always regard as the good angel of my life and indirectly it is true the bringer about of the one and only real happiness i have ever known from the time of the episode i have just described at such length to the present day i can safely say that i have neither touched a card nor owed a man a penny piece that i was not fully prepared to pay at a moment's notice and with this assertion i must revert to the statement made at the commencement of this chapter the saddest a man can make as i said then there could be no doubt about it that i was a failure although i had improved in the particulars just stated fate was plainly against me i worked hard and passed my examinations with comparative ease yet it seemed to do me no good with those above me the sacred fire of enthusiasm which had at first been so conspicuously absent had now taken complete hold of me i studied night and day grudging myself no labour yet by some mischance everything i touched recoiled upon me and like the serpent of the fable stung the hand that fostered it certainly i was not popular and since it was due almost directly to kelleran's influence that i took to my work with such assiduity it seemed strange that i should also have to attribute my non-success to his agency as a matter of fact he was not a good leader to follow from the very first he had shown himself to be a man of strange ideas he was no follower or stickler for the orthodox to sum him up in plainer words he was what might be described as an experimentalist in return the authorities of the hospital looked somewhat askance upon him finally he passed out into the world and the same term saw me appointed to the rank of house surgeon almost simultaneously my father died and to the horror of the family an examination of his affairs instead of proving him the wealthy man we supposed him to be showed there was barely sufficient when his liabilities were paid to meet the expenses of his funeral the shock of his death and the knowledge of the poverty to which he had been so suddenly reduced proved too much for my mother and she followed him a few weeks later thus i was left so far as i knew without kith or kin in the world with but a few friends no money and the poorest possible prospects of ever making it the circumstances under which i lost the position of house surgeon i will not allude let it suffice that i did lose it and that although the authorities seem to think otherwise i am in a position to prove whenever i desire to do so that i was not the real culprit the effect however was the same i was disgraced beyond hope of redemption and the proud career i had mapped out for myself was now beyond my reach for good and all over the next twelve months it would be better that i should draw a veil even now i scarcely like to think of them it is enough for me to say that for upwards of a month i remained in london searching high and low for employment this however was easier looked for than discovered try how i would i could hear of nothing then weary of the struggle i accepted an offer made me and left england as a surgeon on board an outward bound passenger steamer for australia ill luck however still pursued me for at the end of my second voyage the company went into liquidation and its vessels were sold i shipped on board another boat in a similar capacity did two voyages in her to the cape where on a friend's advice i bade her good-bye and started for a shanty as surgeon to an inland trading company while there i was wounded in the neck by a spear was compelled to leave the company's service and eventually found myself back once more in london tramping the streets in search of employment fortunately i had managed to save a small sum from my pay so that i was not altogether destitute it was not long however before this was exhausted 
and then things looked blacker than they had ever done before what to do i knew not i had long since cast my pride to the winds and was now prepared to take anything no matter what then an idea struck me and on it i acted leaving my lodgings on the surrey side of the river i crossed blackfriars bridge and made my way along the embankment in a westerly direction as i went i could not help contrasting my present appearance with that i had shown on the last occasion i had walked that way then i had been as spruce and neat as a man could well be boasted a good coat to my back and a new hat upon my head now however the coat and hat instead of speaking for my prosperity as at one time they might have done bore unmistakable evidence of the disastrous change which had taken place in my fortunes indeed if the truth must be confessed i was about as sorry a specimen of the professional man as could be found in the length and breadth of the metropolis reaching the thoroughfare in which i had heard kellerin had taken up his abode i cast about me for a means of ascertaining his number compared with that in which i myself resided this was a street of palaces and it seemed to me i could read the characters of the various tenants in the appearance of each house front the particular one before which i was standing at the moment was frivolous in the extreme the front door was daintily painted an elaborate knocker ornamented the centre panel while the windows were without exception curtained with expensive stuffs everything pointed to the mistress being a lady of fashion and having put one thing and another together i felt convinced i should not find my friend there the next i came to was a residence of more substantial type here everything was solid and plain even to the borders of severity if i could sum up the owner he was a successful man a lawyer from choice a bachelor and possibly even probably a bigot on matters of religion he would have two or three friends not more i thought all of whom would be advanced in years and like himself successful men of business he would be able to appreciate a glass of dry sherry would have nothing to do with anything that did not bear the impress of being a gilt-edged security as neither of these houses seemed to suggest that they would be likely to know anything of the man i wanted i made my way farther down the street keeping my eyes open as i proceeded at last i came to a standstill before one that i was prepared to swear was inhabited by my old friend his character was stamped unmistakably upon every inch of it the untidy windows the pile of books upon the table behind them the marks upon the front door where his impatient foot had often pressed while he turned his latch-key all these spoke of kelleran and i was certain my instinct was not misleading me ascending the steps i rang the bell it was answered by a tall somewhat austere woman of between forty and fifty years of age upon whom a coquettish frilled apron and cap sat with an incongruous effect as i afterwards learnt she had been kelleran's nurse in bygone years and since he had become a householder she had taken charge of his domestic arrangement and ruled both himself and his maid-servants with a rod of iron would you be kind enough to inform me if mr kelleran is at home i asked after he had taken stock of each other he has been abroad for more than three months the woman answered abruptly then seeing the disappointment upon my face she added i don't know when we may expect him home he may be here on saturday and on the other hand we may not see him for two or three weeks to come perhaps you'll not mind telling me what your business with him may be it's not very important i answered humbly feeling that my position was to say the least of it an invidious one i am an old friend and i want to see him for a few minutes since however he's not at home it does not matter i assure you i shall have other opportunities of communicating with him at the same time you might be kind enough to tell him i called in that case you'd better let me know your name she replied with a look that suggested as plainly as any words could speak that she did not for an instant believe my assertion that i was a friend of her master's my name is ingleby i said mr kelleran will be sure to remember me we were at the same hospital she gave a scornful sniff as if such a thing would be very unlikely and then made as if she would shut the door in my face i was not however to be put off in this fashion taking a card from my pocket i scrawled upon it 
I scrawled my name and present address upon it and handed it to her. Perhaps if you will show that to Mr. Kelleran, you would not mind writing to me when he comes home, I said. That is where I am living just now. She glanced at the card, and then noting the locality, sniffed even more scornfully than before. It was evident this was the only thing wanting to confirm the bad impression I had created in her mind. For some seconds there was an ominous silence. Very well, she answered at length. I'll give it to him, but why, heaven save us, what's the matter? You're as white as a sheet. Why didn't you say you were feeling ill? i had been running it rather close for more than a week past, and the news that Kelleran, my last hope, was absent from England, had unnerved me altogether. A sudden giddiness seized me, and under the influence of it, I should have fallen to the ground had I not clutched the railings by my side. It was then that the real nature of the woman became apparent. Like a ministering angel, she half led, half supported me into the house, and seated me on a chair in the somewhat sparsely furnished hall. Friend of the master or no friend, I heard her say to herself, I'll take the risk of it. I heard no more, for my senses had left me. When they returned, I found myself lying upon a sofa in Keller and study, the housekeeper standing by my side, and a maid-servant casting sympathetic glances at me from the doorway. I am afraid I put you to a lot of trouble, I said, as soon as I had recovered myself sufficiently to speak. I cannot think what made me go off like that. I have never done such a thing in my life before. You can't think, queried the woman, with a curious intonation that was not lost upon me, then it's very plain you've not much wit about you. I think, young man, I could make a very good guess at the truth if I wanted to. Howsoever, let that be as it may. I'll put a bit of it right before you leave this house, or my name's not what it is. And turning to the maid, who was still watching me, she continued sharply, Be off about your business, miss, and do as I told you. Are you going to waste all afternoon standing there, staring about you like a gabby? The girl disappeared, only to return a few minutes later with a tray upon which was a substantial meal of cold meat. On the old woman's authorization, I sat down to it, and dined as I had not done for months past. There, she said with an air of triumph as I finished, that will make a new man of you. And having done all she could for me, and repenting perhaps of the leniency she had shown me, she returned to her former abrupt demeanour, and informed me in terms that there was no mistake in that her time was valuable, and that it behoved me to be off about my business as soon as possible. While she had been speaking, my eyes had travelled round the room until they alighted upon the mantelpiece. It was covered with pipes, books, photographs, and all the innumerable odds and ends that accumulate in a bachelor's apartment. Where I discovered my own portrait with several others. I remembered having given it to Kelleran two years before. It was not a very good one, but with its assistance I proposed to establish my identity, proved to my stern benefactor that I was not altogether the impostor she believed me to be. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to you for all you have done, I said, as I rose and prepared to make my departure from the house. At the same time, I am very much afraid you do not altogether believe that I am the friend of your masters that I pretend to be. Tut, tut, she answered. If I were in your place, I'd say no more about that. Least said, soon as mended is my motto. I trust, however, I am a Christian woman, and do my best to help folk in distress, but I've warned ye already that I have eyes in my head, and wit enough to tell what's a clock just as well as my neighbours. Why, bless my soul, you don't think I've been all my years in the world without knowing what's what or who's who? She paused as if for breath, and embracing the opportunity, I crossed the room and took from the chimney-piece the photograph to which I had just alluded. Possibly this may help to reassure you, I said as I placed it before her. I do not think I have changed that much since it was taken that you should fail to recognise me. She picked up the photo and looked at it, reading the signature at the bottom with a puzzled face. Heaven save us, so it is, she cried, when the meaning of it dawned upon her. You are Mr. Ingleby after all. Well, I'm a softy, to be sure. I thought you were trying to take me in. So many people come here asking to see him, saying they're at the hospital with him. If I'd have thought it really was you, I'd have bitten my tongue out before I'd have said what I did. Why, sir? Why, sir, the master talks of you to this day. Thing will be this, and Ingleby that, from morning till night. 
Many's the time he's made inquiries from gentlemen who've been here in the hope of finding out what has become of you. God bless him, I said, with my heart warming at the news that he had not forgotten me. We were the best of friends once. But, Mr. Ingleby, continued the old woman after a pause, if you'll allow me to say so, I don't like to see you like this. You must have seen a lot of trouble, sir, to have got into such a state. The world has not treated me very kindly, I answered with an attempt at a smile. But I'll tell Kelleran all about it when I see him. You think it's possible he may be home on Saturday? I hope so, sir. I'm sure she replied. You may be certain I'll give him your address and tell him you've called the moment I see him. I thanked her again for her trouble and took my departure, feeling a very different man as I went down the steps and turned my face cityward. In my own heart, I felt certain Kelleran would do something to help me. Had I known, however, what that something was destined to be, I wonder whether I should have awaited his coming with such eagerness. As it transpired, it was on the Friday following my call at his house, and on returning to my lodgings after another day's fruitless search for employment, I found the following letter awaiting me. The handwriting was as familiar to me as my own, and it made me imagine with what eagerness I tore open the envelope and scanned the contents. It ran, My dear Ingleby, it was a pleasant welcome home to hear that you were in England once more. I am sorry, however, to find from my housekeeper that affairs have not been prospering with you. This must be remedied, and at once. I flatter myself I am just the man to do it. It is possible you may consider me unfeeling when I say that there were never such luck as yours being in want of employment at this particular moment. I have a billet standing by and waiting for you, one of the very sort you are best fitted for, and one which you will enjoy unless you have lost your former instincts. You have never met Dr. Nicola, but you must do so without delay. I tell you, Ingleby, he is the most wonderful man with whom I have ever been brought in contact. We chanced upon each other in St. Petersburg three months ago, and since then he's had a fascination for me such as no other man has ever had. I have spoken of you to him, and in consequence he dines with me tonight in the hope of meeting you. Whatever else you do, therefore, do not fail to put in an appearance. You cannot guess the magnitude of the experiment upon which he is at work. At first glance, and in any other man, it would seem incredible, impossible, almost absurd. When, however, you have seen him, I venture to say you will not doubt that he will carry it through. Let me count upon you tonight, then, at seven. Always your friend, Andrew Fairfax Kelleran. I read the letter again. What did it mean? At any rate, it contained a ray of hope. It would have to be a very curious billet, I told myself, under present circumstances, that I would refuse. But who was this extraordinary individual, Dr. Nicola, who seemed to have exercised such a fascination over my enthusiastic friend? Well, that I had to find out for myself. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The clocks in the neighbourhood had scarcely ceased striking when I ascended the steps of Calaran's house and rang the bell. Even had he not been so impressive in his invitation, there was small likelihood of my forgetting the appointment. I had been waiting for it hour by hour with an impatience that can only be understood when I say that each one was bringing me nearer the only proper meal I had had since I last visited his abode. The door was opened to me by the same faithful housekeeper, who had proved herself such a ministering angel on the previous occasion. She greeted me as an old friend, but with a greater respect than she had shown when we had last talked together. This did not prevent her, however, from casting a scrutinising eye over me, as much as to say, you look a bit more respectable, my lad. Your coat is very green at the seams, your collar is frayed at the edge, and you sniff the smell of dinner as if you had not had a decent meal for longer than you care to think about. All of which would have been perfectly true. Step inside, she said. Mr. Kelleran's waiting for you in the study, I know. Then, sinking her voice to a whisper, she added, there's duck and green peas for dinner. 
and as soon as the other gentleman arrives i shall tell cook to dish he'll not be long now what answer i should have returned i cannot say but as she finished speaking a door further down the passage opened and my old friend made his appearance with that impetuosity which always characterised him ingleby my dear fellow he cried as he ran with outstretched hand to greet me i cannot tell you how pleased i am to see you again it seems years since i last set eyes on you come along in here i want to have a good look at you we've tons of things to say to each other and heaps of questions to ask haven't we and by jove we must look sharp about it too for in a few minutes nikola will be here i asked him to come at quarter past seven in order that we might have a little time alone together first so saying he led me into his study the same in which i had returned to my senses after my fainting fit a few days before and bade me seat myself in an easy chair you can't think how good it is to see you again Kellerad, i said as soon as i could get in a word i begin to think myself forgotten by all my friends bosh was his uncompromising reply talk about your friends why you never know who they are till you're in trouble at least that's what i always think and by the way let me tell you that you do look a bit pulled down i wonder what idiocy you've been up to since i saw you last tell me all about it you won't smoke very good now fire away thus encouraged i told him in a few words all my experiences since we had last met while i was talking he stood before me his face lit up with interest and to all intents and purposes as absorbed in my story as as if it had been his own well thank goodness it's all over now he said when i brought my tale to a conclusion i found you a billet that will suit you admirably and if you play your cards well there's no saying to what it may not lead nikola is the most marvellous man in the world as you will admit when you meet him i for one have never seen anybody like him and as for this new scheme of his why if he brings it off i give you my word it will revolutionise science i was too well acquainted with my friend's enthusiastic way of talking to be surprised at it at the same time i was thoroughly conversant with his cleverness and for this reason i was prepared to believe if he thought well of any scheme that there was something out of the common in it but what is this wonderful idea i asked scarcely able to contain my longing as the fumes of dinner penetrated to us from the regions below and how am i affected by it that i must leave for dr nikola to tell you himself Kelleran replied let it suffice for the moment that i envy your opportunity i believe if i had been able to avail myself of the chance he offered me of going into it with him i should have been compelled to sacrifice you but there you will hear all about it in good time for if i mistake not that is his cab drawing up outside now it is one of his peculiarities to be always punctual to the moment will you make the right time by your watch i was obliged to confess that i possess no watch it had been turned into the necessaries of existence long since Calloran must have seen what was passing in my mind though he pretended not to have noticed it at any rate he said i make it a quarter past seven to the minute and i am prepared to wager that's our man the bell rang almost before the sound of it had died away the study door opened and the housekeeper with a look of awe upon her face which had not been there when she addressed me announced dr nikola looking back on it now in spite of all that has happened since i find that my impressions of that moment are as fresh and as clear as if it had happened yesterday i can see the tall lithe figure of this extraordinary man his sallow face and his piercing black eyes steadfastly regarding me as if he were trying to determine whether i was capable of assisting him in the work upon which he was so exhaustively engaged never before had i seen such eyes they seemed to look me through and through and to read my inmost thought this gentleman my dear kellerad he began after they had shaken hands without waiting for me to be introduced to him should be your friend ingleby of whom you have so often spoken to me how do you do mr ingleby i don't think there is much doubt but that we shall work admirably together you have lately been in a shanty i perceive i admitted that i had and went on to inquire how he had become aware of it for as kelleran had not known until a few minutes before i did not see 
how he could be acquainted with the fact it's not a very difficult thing to tell he answered with a smile at my astonishment seeing that you carry about with you the mark of a guato spear if it were necessary i could tell you some more things that would surprise you for instance i could tell you that the man who cut it out for you was an amateur at his work that he was left-handed he was short-sighted and that he was recovering from malaria at the time all this is plain to the eye but i see our friend Calleran fancies his dinner is getting cold so we had better postpone the subject for a more convenient opportunity we accordingly left the study and proceeded to the dining-room all day long i had been looking forward to that moment with the eagerness of a starving man yet when it arrived i scarcely touched anything if the truth must be confessed there was something about this man that made me forget such mundane matters as mere eating and drinking and i noticed that nikola himself scarcely touched anything this reason save for the fact that he himself enjoyed it the bountiful spread kelleran had arranged was completely wasted during the progress of the meal no mention was made of the great experiment upon which our host had informed me nikola was engaged our conversation was mainly devoted to travel nikola i soon discovered had been everywhere and he had seen everything there appeared to be no place on the face of the habitable globe with which he was not acquainted and of which he could not speak with the authority of an old resident china india australia south america north south east and west africa were as familiar to him as piccadilly and it was in connection with one of the last named countries that a curious incident cropped up we had been discussing various cases of catalepsy and to illustrate an argument he was adducing kelleran narrated a curious instance of lethargy which he had seen in southern russia while he was speaking i noticed that nikola's face wore an expression that was partly one of derision and partly one of amusement i think i can furnish you with an instance that's even more extraordinary i said when our host had finished and as i did so nikola leaned a little towards me in fairness to your argument however caravan i must admit that why it comes under the same category the malady in question confines itself almost exclusively to the black races on the west coast of africa you refer to the sleeping sickness i presume said nikola whose eyes were fixed upon me and who was paying the greatest attention to all i said exactly the sleeping sickness i answered i was fortunate enough to see several instances of it when i was on the west coast though the one to which i am referring did not come before me personally but was described to me by a man a rather curious character who happened to be in the district at the time the negro in question a fine healthy fellow of about twenty years of age was servant to a portuguese trader at cape coast castle he had been up country on some trading expedition or other and during the whole time had enjoyed the very best of health for the first few days after his return to the coast however he was unusually depressed a slight swelling of the cervical gland set in accompanied by a tendency to fall asleep at any time this somnolency gradually increased cutaneous stimulation was tried at first with comparative success the symptoms however soon recurred the periods of sleep became longer and more frequent until at last the patient could scarcely have been said to be ever awake the case so my informant said was an extremely interesting one what was the result inquired kelleran a little impatiently you have not told us to what all this is leading well the result was that in due course the patient became extremely emaciated a perfect skeleton in fact he would take no food answered no questions and did not open his eyes from morning till night to make a long story short just as my informant was beginning to think that the end was approaching there appeared in cape coast castle a mysterious stranger who put forward a claims to the knowledge of medicine he foregathered with my man and after a while obtained permission to try his hand upon the negro you killed him at once of course nothing of the sort the thing happened that you will scarcely credit the whole business was most irregular i believe but my friend was not likely to worry himself much about that this new man had his own pharmacopoeia a collection of essences in small bottles more like what they used in the middle ages than anything else i should imagine having obtained possession of the patient he carried him away to a hut outside the town took him in hand there and then 
the man who told me about it and who i should have said had a good experience of the disease assured me that he was as certain as any one possibly could be that the chap would not live out the week and yet when the newcomer ten days later invited him to visit the hut there was the man acting as his servant waiting at table if you please and to all intents and purposes though very thin as well as ever he had been in his life but my dear fellow protested kellerin Guerin says that out of the hundred and forty-eight cases that come under his notice a hundred and forty-eight died can't help that i said a little warmly i'm afraid i'm only telling you what my friend told me he gave me his word of honour that the result was as he had described but i had not finished my story when you interrupted me the strangest part of the whole business has yet to be told it appears that the man had not only cured the fellow but that he had, had the power of returning him to the condition in which he found him at will it wasn't hypnotism what it was is more than i can say at any rate my informant described it to me as about being the uncanniest performance he had ever witnessed in what way asked kelleran furnish us with a more detailed account there was a time when you were a famous hand at the diagnosis i would willingly do so i answered unfortunately however i can't remember it all it appears that he was always saying the most mysterious things and putting the strangest questions and on one occasion he asked my friend as they were standing by the negro's bedside if there was any one whose image he would care to see merton at first thought he was making fun of him but seeing that he was in earnest he considered for a moment and eventually answered that he would very much like to see the portrait of an old shipmate who had perished at sea some six or seven years prior to his arrival on the west coast as soon as he had said this the man stooped over the bed and opening the sleeping nigger's eyes examine the retina he said and i think you will see what you want my friend looked and what did he see inquired kellerin nicholas said nothing but smiled as i thought a trifle sceptically seems an absurd thing to say i know i continued but he swore to me that he had before him the exact picture of the man he had referred to standing on the deck of a steamer just as he had last seen him it was as clear and distinct as if it had been a photograph and all the time the negro was asleep fast asleep i answered oh, i should very much like to meet your friend said kelleran emphatically a man with an imagination like that must be an exceedingly interesting companion but seriously my dear ingleby you don't mean to say you wish us to believe that all this really happened i am telling you what he told me i answered i cannot swear to the truth of it of course but i will go as far as to say that i do not think he was intentionally deceiving me kelleran shrugged his shoulders incredulously for some moments an uncomfortable silence ensued this was broken by nikola my dear kelleran he said i don't think you're altogether fair to our friend ingleby as he admits he was only speaking on hearsay and under these circumstances he might very easily have been deceived fortunately however for the sake of his reputation i am in a position to corroborate all he has said the deuce you are cried kelleran well i was too much astonished to speak I could only stare at him in complete surprise what on earth do you mean pray explain i can only do so by saying i was the man who did this apparently wonderful thing kelleran and i continued to stare at him in amazement could he be laughing at us and yet his face was serious enough you do not seem to credit my assertion said nikola quietly and yet i assure you it is correct i was the mysterious individual who appeared in cape coast castle who brought with him his own pharmacopoeia and who wrought the miracle which your friend appears to have considered so wonderful the coincidence is so extraordinary i answered as if in protest coincidences are necessarily extraordinary nikola replied i do not see that this is one more so than usual and the miracle it was in reality no miracle at all he answered but a logical outcome of a perfectly natural process pray do not look so incredulous i am aware that my statement is difficult to believe but i assure you that my dear ingleby that it is quite true however proof is always better than the search so since you are still sceptical let me make my position right with you for reasons that would be self-evident i cannot produce the effect in a negro's eye but i can do so in a way that will strike you as being scarcely less marvellous if you draw up your chairs i will endeavour to explain needless to remark we did as he desired 
and when we were seated on either side of him waited for the manifestation he had promised us taking a small silver box but a little larger than a card case from his pocket he opened it and tipped what might have been a teaspoonful of black powder into the centre of a dessert plate i watched it closely in the hope of being able to discover of what it was composed my efforts however were unavailing it was black as i have already said and from a distance resembled powdered charcoal this however it could not have been by reason of its strange liquidity which was as great as that of quicksilver and which came into operation when it had been exposed to the air some minutes hither and thither the stuff ran about the dish and i noticed that as it did so it gradually lost its original sombre hue and took to itself a variety of colours that were as brilliant as the component tints of the spectrum these scintillated and quivered till the eyes were almost blinded by their radiance and yet it riveted the attention in such a manner that it was well nigh if not quite impossible to look away or think of anything else in vain i tried to calm myself in order that i might be a cool and collected observer of what was taking place whether there was any perfume thrown off by the stuff upon the plate i cannot say but as i watched it my head began to swim and my eyelids felt as heavy as lead now this was not fancy upon my part is borne out by the fact that kelleran afterwards confessed to me that he experienced exactly the same sensations nicola however was still manipulating the dish turning it this way and that as if he were anxious to produce as many varieties of colour as possible in a given time it must have been upwards of five minutes before he spoke and as he did so he gave the plate an extra tilt so that the mixture ran down to one side it was now a deep purple in colour i think if you will look into the centre of the fluid you will see something that will go a long way towards convincing you of the truth of the assertion i made just now he said quietly but without turning his head to look at me i looked as he desired but at first could see nothing save the mixture itself which was fast turning from purple to blue this blue soon grew paler and as i watched to my astonishment a picture formed itself before my eyes i saw a long wooden house surrounded on all sides by a deep veranda the latter was covered with a beautiful flowering creeper on either side of the dwelling was a grove of palms and to the right showing like a pool of dazzling quicksilver between the trees was the sea and over everything was a sensation of intense heat at first glance i could not recall the house but it was not long before i recognised the residence of the man who had told me the story which had occasioned this miracle i looked at it again and could even see the window of the room in which i had recovered from my first severe attack of fever and from which i never thought to have emerged alive with the sight of it the recollection of that miserable time came back to me kelleran and even his friend nicola were for the time being forgotten from the expression on your face i gather that you know the place said nicola after i had been watching it for a few moments now look into the veranda and tell me if you recognise the two men you see seated there i looked again and saw that one was myself while the other was the man who was leaning against the veranda rail smoking a cigar was the owner of the house itself there could be no mistake about it the whole scene was as plain before my eyes as if it had been a photograph taken on the spot there said nicola with a little note of triumph in his voice i hope that will convince you that when i say i can do a thing i mean it so saying he tilted the saucer and the picture vanished in a whirl of colour i tried to protest but before i had time to say anything the liquid had in some strange fashion resolved itself once more into a powder nicola had tipped it back into the silver box and kelleran and i were left to put the best explanation we could upon it we looked at each other and feeling that i could not make head or tail of what i had seen i waited for him to speak i never saw such a thing in my life he cried when he found sufficient voice if anyone had told me that such a thing was possible i would not have believed him i can scarcely credit the evidence of my senses now in fact you feel towards the little exhibition i have just given you very much as you did to ingleby's story a quarter of an hour ago said nicola what a doubting world it is to be sure the same world which ridiculed the notion there could be anything in vaccination 
in the steam engine in chloroform the telegraph the telephone or the phonograph for how many years has it scoffed at the power of hypnotism how many of our cleverest scientists fifty years ago could have foretold the discovery of argon or the possibility of being able to telegraph without the aid of wires and because the little world of today knows these things and has survived the wonder of them it thinks it has attained the end of wisdom the folly of it to-night i have shown you something for which less than a hundred years ago i should have been stoned as a wizard at my death the secret will be given to the world and the world when it has recovered from its astonishment will say how very simple why did no one think of it before i tell you gentlemen nikola continued rising and standing before the fireplace that we three to-night are standing on the threshold of a discovery which will shake the world to its foundations when he had moved kelleran and i had also pushed back our chairs from the table and were now watching him as if turned to stone the sacred fire of enthusiasm which i thought had left me for ever was once more kindling in my breast and i hung upon his words as if i were afraid i might lose even that breath that escaped his lips as for nikola himself his usually pallid face was now aglow with excitement the story is as old as the hills he began ever since the days when our first parents trod the earth there have been men who have aimed at discovering a means of lengthening the span of life in the very infancy of science the wisest and cleverest have devoted their lives to the study of the human body in the hope of mastering its secret assisting in the search for that particular something which was to revolutionize the world we find zosimus the theban the jewess maria the arabian Giba, hermes trismegatus linnaeus Basilius, cuvier raymond lully paracelsus roger bacon de lille albertus magnus and even dr price each in his turn quarried into the mountain of wisdom and died having failed to achieve the success he hoped for and why because egotistical as it may seem on my part to say so they did not seek in the right place they commenced at the wrong point and worked from it in the wrong direction but if they failed to find what they wanted they at least rendered good service to those who followed after for from every failure something may be learned for my part i have studied the subject in every form in every detail for more years than i can tell you i have lived for it dreamed of it fought for it and overcome obstacles of the very existence of which no man could dream the work of my predecessors is known to me i have studied their writings tested their experiments to the last particular all the knowledge that modern science has accumulated i have acquired the magic of the east i have explored and tested to the utmost three years ago i visited thibet under extraordinary circumstances there in a certain place inaccessible to the ordinary man and at the risk of my own life and that of the brave man who accompanied me i obtained the information which was destined to prove the coping stone of the great discovery i have since made only two things were wanting then to complete the whole and to enable me to get to work one of these i had just found in st peterburg when i first met you kelleran the other i discovered three weeks ago it has been a long and tedious search but such labour only makes success the sweeter the machinery is now prepared all that remains is to fit the various parts together in six months time if all goes well i will have a man walking upon this earth who under certain conditions shall live a thousand years i could scarcely believe that i heard aright was the man deliberately asking us to believe that he had really found the way to prolong human life indefinitely it sounded very much like it and yet this was the nineteenth century and but at this point i ceased my speculations had i not only that evening witnessed an exhibition of his marvellous powers if he had penetrated so far into the unknowable at least what we consider the unknowable as to be able to work such a miracle why should we doubt that he could carry out what he was now professing to be able to do and when shall we be permitted to hear the result of your labours asked kelleran with a humility that was surprising for a man usually so self-assertive who can say asked nikola these things are more or less dependent on time 
it may be only a short period before i am ready on the other hand a lifetime may elapse the process is above all a gradual one and to hurry it might be to spoil everything and now my dear canaran with your permission i will bid you good night i leave for the north at daybreak and i have much to do before i go if i am not taking you away too soon ingleby perhaps you would not mind walking a short distance with me i have a good deal to say to you i should be very pleased i answered and the look that Kelleran gave me showed me that he considered my decision a wise one. In that case, come along, said Nicola. Good night, Kelleran. Many thanks for the introduction you have given me. I feel quite sure Ingleby and I will get on admirably together. He shook hands with Kelleran and passed into the hall, leaving me alone with a man who had proved my benefactor for the second time in my life. Good night, old fellow, I said, as I shook him by the hand i cannot thank you sufficiently for your goodness in putting me in the way of this billet it has given me another chance and i shan't forget your kindness as long as i live don't be absurd kelleran answered you take things too seriously i feel sure your advantage is as much nicholas as yours he's a wonderful man and you're the very fellow he requires between you you ought to be able to bring about something that will upset the calculations of certain pompous old fossils of our acquaintance good night and good luck to you so saying he led us out of the front door and stood upon the doorstep watching us as we walked down the street it was an exquisite night the moon was almost at the full and her mellow rays made the street almost as light as day my companion and i did for some distance walk in silence he did not speak and i already entertained too much respect for him to interrupt his reverie more than once i glanced at his tall graceful figure and the admirably shaped head which seemed such a fitting case for the extraordinary brain inside as i said just now he began at length as if we were continuing a conversation which had been suddenly interrupted i leave at daybreak for the north of england for the purposes of the experiment i am about to make it is vitally necessary that i should possess a residence far removed from other people where I should not run any risk of being disturbed. For this reason, I have purchased Allardyne Castle in Northumberland, a fine old place overlooking the North Sea. It is by no means an easy spot to get at, and should suit my purposes admirably. I shall not see you before I go, so that whatever I have to say had better be said at once. To begin with, I presume you have made up your mind to assist me in the work I am about to undertake. If you consider me competent, I answered, I shall be only too glad to do so. Kelleran has assured me that I could not have a better assistant, he replied, and I am willing to take you upon his recommendation. If you have no objection to bring forward, we may as well consider the matter settled. Have you any idea as to the remuneration you will require? I answered that I had not, and that I would leave it to him to give me what he considered fair in reply he named a sum that almost took my breath away i remarked that i should be satisfied with half the amount whereupon he laughed good-humouredly i'm afraid we're neither of us good business men he said by all the laws of trade on finding that i offered you more than you expected you should have stood out for twice as much still i like you all the better for your honesty and now my road turns off here and i will bid you good night in an hour i will send my servants to you with a letter containing full instructions i need scarcely say that i am sure you will carry them out to the letter i will do so come what may i answered seriously then good night he said and held out his hand to me all being well we shall meet again in two or three days good night i replied then with a wave of his hand to me he sprang into a hansom which he had called up to the pavement gave the direction to the driver and a moment later was round the corner and out of sight after he had gone i continued my homeward journey i had not been in the house an hour before i was informed that someone was at the door desiring to see me i accordingly hurried downstairs to find myself face to face with the most extraordinary individual i have ever seen in my life first glance i scarcely knew what to make of him but when the light from the hall lamp fell upon his face i saw that he was a chinaman and the ugliest i have ever seen in all my experience of the mongolian race his eyes squinted terribly a portion of his nose was missing and he was minus his left ear it was the sort of face one sees in a nightmare and accustomed as i was by my profession 
to horrible sights i must admit my gorge rose at him at first it did not occur to me to connect him with nikola do you want to see me i inquired in some astonishment he nodded his head but did not speak what's it about i continued he uttered a peculiar grunt and produced a letter and a small box from his pocket both of which he handed to me i understood immediately from whom he came signing him to remain where he was until i could tell him whether there was an answer i turned into the house and opened the letter having read it i returned to the front door you can tell dr nikola that i will be sure to attend to it i said you savvy he nodded his head and next moment was on his way down the street when he was out of sight i returned to my bedroom and lighting the gas once more perused the communication i had received as i did so a piece of paper fell from between the leaves i picked it up to discover that it was a cheque for one hundred pounds payable to myself the letter ran my dear ingleby according to the promise i made you this evening i am sending you here with your instructions as clearly worked out as i can make them to begin with i want you to remain in town until monday next on the morning of that day if all goes well you will be advised by the agent of the company in london of the arrival of the river of the steamship donna mercedes bound from cadiz to newcastle on receipt of that information you will be good enough to board her and to inquire for don miguel de moreno and his great-granddaughter who are passengers by the boat to england i have already arranged with the company for your passage so you have no anxiety upon that score you will find the don a very old man and i beg that you will take the greatest possible care of him for this reason i have sent you accompanying drugs each of which is labelled with the fullest instructions they should not be made use of unless absolutely required here followed a list of the various symptoms for which i was to watch and an exhaustive resume of the treatment i was to employ in the event of certain contingencies arising on the arrival of the vessel in newcastle the letter continued i will communicate with you again in the meantime i send you what i think will serve to pay your expenses until we meet your sincere friend nikola p s one last word of warning should you by any chance be brought into contact with a certain mongolian of a very sinister appearance and boasting but one ear have nothing whatsoever to do with him keep out of his way and above all let him know nothing of your connection with myself this i beg you to believe is no idle warning for all our lives depend upon it having thoroughly mastered the contents of this curious epistle i turned my attention to the parcel which had accompanied it this i found was made up of a number of small packets evidently containing powders and two ounce vials of some tasteless and scentless liquid to which i was quite unable to assign a name once more i glanced at the letter in order to make sure of the name of the man whose guardian i was destined for the future to be de moreno was the name and his granddaughter was accompanying him in an idle dreamy way i wondered what the latter would prove to be like for some reason or other i found myself thinking a good deal of her and when i fell asleep that night it was to dream that she was standing before me with outstretched hands imploring me to save her not only from a certain one-eared chinaman but also from Nicola himself. End of chapter 2after my meeting with nikola at kelleran's house it was a new prospect that life opened up for me i confronted the future with a smiling face and no longer told myself as i had done so often of late that failure and i were inseparable companions and for any success i might hope to achieve in the world i had better be out of it on the contrary when i retired to rest after the receipt of nikola's letter as narrated in the preceding chapter it was with happier heart than i had known for more than two years past and a fixed determination that happen what might even if his wonderful experiment came to naught my new employer should not find me lacking in desire to serve him as for that experiment itself i scarcely knew what to think about it
to a man who had studied the human frame its wonderful mechanism combined with its many deficiencies and imperfections it seemed impossible it could succeed and yet strange as it may appear to say so there was something about nikola that made one feel sure he would not embark upon such an undertaking if he were not quite certain or at least had not a well-grounded hope of being able to bring it to a favourable issue however successful or unsuccessful the fact remained that i was to be associated with him and the very thought of such cooperation was sufficient to send the blood tingling through my veins with a new life and strength during the two days that elapsed between my meeting with nikola and the arrival of the vessel for which he had told me to be on the lookout i saw nothing of kelleran i was not idle however in the first place it was necessary for me to replenish my wardrobe which as i have already observed stood in need of considerable additions and in the second i was anxious to consult some books of reference to which nikola had directed my attention by the time i had done these things therefore i had not as may be supposed very much leisure left either for paying visits or for receiving them i was careful however to write thanking him for the good turn he had done me and wishing him good-bye in case i did not see him before i left it was between eight and nine o'clock on the monday morning following that i received a note from the steamship company to which nikola had referred advising me that their vessel the donna mercedes had arrived from cadiz and was now lying in the river and would sail for the north at eleven o'clock precisely accordingly i gathered my luggage together what there was of it and made my way down to her as nikola had predicted i found her lying in the pool on boarding her i was confronted by a big burly man with a long brown beard which blew over either shoulder and met behind his head as if it were some new kind of comforter i inquired for the skipper i am the captain he answered and i suppose you are dr ingleby i had a letter from the owners saying you were going north with us you may be sure we'll do our best to make you comfortable in the meantime the steward will show you your berth and look after your luggage as he said this he beckoned a hand aft and sent him below in search of the official in question i think you have a lady and gentleman on board who are expecting me i remarked after the momentary pause which followed the man's departure that i have sir he answered with emphasis and a nice responsibility they've been for me i wouldn't undertake another like it if i were paid a hundred pounds extra for my trouble but perhaps you know the old gentleman i've never seen him in my life i replied but i have to take charge of him until we get to the north then i wish you joy of your work he continued you'll have your time pretty fully occupied i can tell you in what way i inquired i should consider it a favour if you'll tell me all you can about him is the old gentleman eccentric or what is the matter with him eccentric replied the skipper rolling his tongue round the word as if he liked its flavour well he may be that for all i know but it's not his eccentricity that gives the trouble it's his age why i'll be bound he's a hundred if he's a day he's not a man at all only a bag of bones can't move out of his berth can't walk can't talk can't do a single hand's turn to help himself his bones are almost through his skin his eyes are sunk so far in his head that you can only guess what they're like and when he wants a meal or when he's got to have one i should say for he's past wanting anything why well, i'm blessed if he hasn't to be fed with pap like a baby it's a pitiful sort of plight for a man to come to what do you think he'd be far better dead and buried i thought i understood putting one thing and another together the reason of the old man's journey north could be easily guessed and at that moment the seaman who the skipper had sent in search of the steward made his appearance from the companion followed by the functionary in question to the latter's charge i was consigned and at his suggestion i followed him into the cabin which had been set aside for my accommodation it proved to be situated at the after end of the saloon and was as small and poorly furnished as an affair i had ever slept in make use of the old nautical expression there was scarcely room in it to swing a cat tiny as it was however it was at least better than the back street lodgings i had so lately left and when i reflected that i had paid all i owed had fitted myself out with a new wardrobe and still had upwards of fifty pounds in pocket to say nothing of being engaged on deeply interesting work 
I could have gone down on my knees and kissed the grimy planks in thankfulness. I'm afraid, sir, it's not as large as some you've been accustomed to, said the talkative steward apologetically, as he stowed my bags away in a corner. How do you know what I've been accustomed to? I asked with a smile, as I noticed his desire for conversation. I could tell it directly I saw you look round this berth, he answered. People could say what they please, but to my thinking, there's no mistaking a man who spent any time aboard ship. What line might you have been in, sir? I told him, and had the good fortune to discover his brother had served the same employ. Thus having established a bond in common, I proceeded to question him about my future charges, only to find that this was a subject upon which he was very willing to converse. Well, sir, he began, seating himself familiarly on the edge of my berth and looking up at me. I don't know as I ought to speak about the old gentleman at all, seeing as he's a passenger, and you're, so to speak, in charge of him. But this I do say, without fear or favour, that whoever brought him away from his home and took him to sea at his time of life did a wrong and cruel action. Why, sir, I make so bold as to tell you that from the moment he was brought aboard this ship until the very second, he has not spoken as much as five hundred words to me or to anybody else. He just lays there in his bunk, hour after hour, with his eyes open, looking at the deck above him, and as likely as not holding his great-granddaughter's hand, not seeming to see or hear anything, and never letting one single word pass his lips. I have known what it is to wait upon sick folk myself, having spent close upon eight months in a hospital ashore. But never in my life, sir, and I give you my word, it's gospel truth. I am telling you, I have I seen anything like the way the young girl waits upon him. You'll find her of sitting by him after breakfast, and if you go in at eight bells, she'll still be the same. She has her meals brought to her and eats them there, and at night she gets me to make up her bed on the deck alongside of him. She must indeed be devoted, I answered, considerably touched at the picture he drew. Devoted is no name for it, replied the man with conviction. And it's by no means pleasant work for her, sir, I can assure you. Why, more than once when I've gone there, I've found her leaning over the bunk, her face just as white as the sheet, holding a little looking-glass to his lips to see if he was breathing. Then she'd heave a big sigh of relief to find out that there was still life in him, put the glass back again in its place, and sit down beside him again and go on holding his hand, for all the world as if she was determined to cling on to him until the judgment day. It would bring the tears into your eyes, I'm sure, sir, to see it. You have a tender heart, I can see, I said and I think the better of you for it. Do you happen to know of anything of their history, where they hail from, or who they are? There is one thing I do know, he answered, and that is that they're English and not Spaniards, as the cook said. And as you might very well think yourself from the name, I believe the old gentleman was a merchant of some sort in Cadiz, but that must have been fifty years ago. The young lady is his great-granddaughter, and I was given to understand that her father and mother have been dead for many years. Well, one thing and another, I don't fancy they've got a penny to bless themselves with. But it's plain there's somebody paying the piper, because the skipper got orders from the office just before we sailed, that everything that could be done for their comfort was to be done, and money was no object. But there, here I am, running on in this way to you, sir, who probably know all about them better than I do. I assure you, I know nothing at all, or at least very little, I answered. I have simply received instructions to meet them here and look after the old gentleman until he reaches Newcastle. What will become of them, I can only guess. I presume, however, that I may rely on you for assistance, should I require it. I'll do anything I can, sir, and you may be very sure of that, he replied. I've taken such a liking to that young lady, there's nothing I wouldn't do in reason to make her feel a bit happier, for it's my belief that she's far from easy in her mind just now. I remember once hearing an Orient steward tell of a man who was tied up with a sword hanging over his head by a single hair. He never knew from one minute to another when it would fall and do for him. Well, that's the way I fancy Miss Moreno is feeling. There's a sword hanging over her head or her great-grandfather's and she doesn't know when it will drop. What did you say her name was? I inquired, for I had for the moment forgotten it. Moreno, sir, he replied. The old gentleman is Don Miguel and she is the Donna Consuelo de Moreno. Thank you, I said. And now if you will tell me where their cabin is, I think I will pay the old gentleman a visit. Their cabin is the one facing yours, sir, on the starboard side. 
and if it will be any convenience to you sir i'll tell the young lady you're aboard i know she expects you because she said so only this morning perhaps it would be better that you should tell her i replied if you'll give her my compliments and say that i will do myself the pleasure of waiting upon her as soon as it is convenient for her to see me i shall be obliged i'll remain here until i receive her answer the man departed on his errand and during his absence i spent the time making myself as comfortable as my limited quarters would permit it was not very long however before he returned to inform me that the young lady would be pleased to see me as soon as i cared to visit their cabin placing my stethoscope in my pocket and having thrown a hasty glance into the small looking-glass over the washstand in order to make sure that i presented a fairly respectable appearance i left my quarters and made my way across the saloon since then i have often tried to recall my feelings at that moment but the effort has always been in vain one thing is certain i had no idea of the importance the incident was destined to occupy in the history of my life i knocked upon the door and as i did so heard someone rise from a chair inside the cabin the handle was softly turned and a moment later the most beautiful girl i have ever seen in my life stood before me i have said the most beautiful girl but this does not at all express what i mean nor do i think it is in my power to do so let me however endeavour to give you some idea of what donna consuelo di moreno was like try to picture a tall and stately girl in reality scarcely twenty years of age but looking several years older imagine a pale oval face lit up by dark lustrous eyes with long lashes and delicately pencilled brows a tiny mouth and hair as black as the raven's wing taken altogether it was not only a very beautiful face but a strong one as i looked at her i wondered what the circumstances could have been that had brought her into the power of my extraordinary employer that she was in his power i did not for a moment doubt closing the cabin door softly behind her she stepped into the saloon the steward tells me you are dr ingleby she began speaking excellent english but with a slight foreign accent and holding out her tiny hand to me with charming frankness she continued i was informed by dr nicola in a letter i received this morning that you would join the vessel here it's a great relief to me to know you are on board i said something i forget what in answer to the compliment she paid me and then inquired how her aged relative was he seems fairly well at present she answered as well perhaps as he ever will be but as you may suppose he has given me a great deal of anxiety since we left cadiz this vessel is not a good sea boat and in the bay of biscay we had some very rough weather so rough indeed that more than once i thought she must inevitably founder however we are safely here now so that our troubles are nearly over i don't want you to think i'm a grumbler but i am keeping you here perhaps when you would like to see grandpa for yourself i answered in the affirmative whereupon she softly opened the door again and beckoning me to follow led the way into the cabin if my own quarters on the other side of the saloon had seemed small this one seemed even smaller there was only one bunk and it ran below the porthole in this an old man was lying with his hands clasped upon his breast you need not fear that you will wake him said the girl beside me he sleeps like this the greater part of the day sometimes he frightens me for he lies so still that i become afraid lest he may have passed away without my noticing it i did not at all wonder at her words the old man's pallor was a peculiar ivory white which is never seen save in the very old and then strangely enough in men oftener than women his eyes were deeply sunken as were his cheeks at one time forty years or so before it must have been a powerful face now it was beautiful only in its soft harmonious whiteness a long beard white as the purest snow fell upon and covered his breast and on it lay his fleshless hands with their bony joints and long yellow nails the better to examine him i knelt down beside the bunk and took his right wrist between my finger and thumb as i expected the pulse was barely perceptible for a moment i inclined to the belief that the end of which his great-granddaughter had spoken only a few minutes before had come but a second examination proved that such was not the case i gently replaced his hand and then rose to my feet i can easily understand your anxiety i said 
i think you are wonderfully brave to have undertaken such a voyage however for the future that is to say until we reach newcastle you must let me take it in turns with you to watch him it is very kind of you to offer to do so she replied but i could not remain away from him i have had charge of him for such a long time now that it has become like second nature to me besides if he were to wake and not find me by his side there is no saying what might happen i am everything to him i know so well what he requires as she said this she gave me a look that i could not help thinking was almost one of defiance as if she were afraid that by attending to the old man's wants i might deprive her of his affection accordingly i postponed the consideration of the matter for the moment and having asked a few questions as to the patient's diet retired leaving them once more alone together from the saloon i made my way up to the poop the tide was serving and preparations were being made for getting under way ten minutes later our anchor was at the cat head and we were making our way slowly downstream i had begun one of the most extraordinary voyages that it has ever fallen to the lot of man to undertake during the afternoon i paid several visits to my patient's cabin but on no occasion could i discover any change in his condition he lay in his bunk just as i had first seen him his sunken eyes stared at the woodwork above his head and his left hand clasped that of his great-granddaughter and his left hand clasped that of his great-granddaughter to my surprise the motion of the vessel seemed to cause him a little or no inconvenience unfortunately for him his nurse was an excellent sailor it was in vain i tried to induce her let me take her place while she went up on the deck for a little change her grandfather might want her she said and that excuse seemed to her sufficient to justify such a trifling with her health later on however after dinner i was fortunate enough to be able to induce her to accompany me to the deck for a few moments the steward being left in charge of the patient with instructions to call us should the least change occur by this time we were clear of the river and our bows were pointed in a northerly direction leaving the miserable companion which ascended to the poop directly from the cuddy we began to pace the deck the night was cold and with a little shiver my companion drew her coquettish mantilla more closely about her shoulders there was something in her action which touched me in a manner i cannot describe in some vague fashion it seemed to appeal to me not only for sympathy but for help i saw the beautiful face looking up at me and as we walked i noted the proud way she carried herself and the sailor-like fashion in which she adapted herself to the rolling of the ship it was a beautiful moonlit night and had the vessel remained upon an even keel it would have been very pleasant on deck to be steady however was a feat the crazy old tub seemed incapable of accomplishing we paced the poop perhaps half a dozen times when my companion suddenly stopped and placing her hand upon my arm said dr ingleby you are in dr nicholas confidence i believe can you tell me why we are going to the north of england her question placed me in an awkward predicament as i have said above her loneliness not to mention the devotion she showed to her aging relative had touched me more than a little on the other hand i was nicholas's servant employed by him for a special work and i did not know whether he would wish me to discuss his plans with her you do not answer she continued as she noticed my hesitation and yet i feel sure you must know it all seems so strange only a few weeks ago we were in our own quiet home in spain without a thought of leaving it then dr nikola came upon the scene and now we're on board this ship going up to the north of england and for what purpose did nikola furnish you with no reason i inquired oh yes she replied he told me that if i would bring my grandfather to england to see him he would make him quite a strong man again for some reason or another however i feel certain there is something behind it that's being kept from me is this so i am not in a position to give you any answer that would be at all likely to satisfy you i replied i am afraid a little ambiguously for i really know nothing myself it's only fair that i should tell you that i met dr nikola for the first time a few days ago but he sent you here to be with my grandfather she continued authoritatively surely dr ingleby you must be able to throw some light upon the mystery which surrounds this voyage i shook my head and with a little sigh of regret she ceased to question me a few minutes later she gave me a stately bow 
and bidding me good night prepared to go below knowing that i had deceived her and hoping to find some opportunity of putting myself right with her i followed her down the companion ladder and along the saloon to her cabin perhaps i'd better see my patient before i retire to rest i said as we stood together at the door holding on to the handle and balancing ourselves against the rolling of the ship she threw a quick glance at me as if for some reason she was surprised at my decision the expression however passed from her face as quickly as it had come and opening the door she entered the cabin and i followed she could scarcely have advanced a step towards the bunk before she uttered an exclamation of surprise and horror the steward who was supposed to have been watching the invalid was fast asleep while the latter's head had slipped from its pillow and was now lying in a most unnatural position his chin in the air his eyes open but still fixed upon the ceiling in the same glassy stare i have described before in her dismay the girl said something in spanish which i am unable to interpret and leaning over the bunk gazed into her great-grandfather's face as if she were afraid of what she might find there the steward meanwhile had recovered his senses and was staring stupidly from one to the other of us hardly able to realize the consequences of his inattention though all this had taken some time to describe it was really the action of a moment and signing the steward to stand back and gently pushing the young girl to one side i knelt down and commenced my examination of my patient there could be no doubt about one thing the old man's condition was eminently serious if he lived at all there was but little more than a flicker of life left in him it was a question that at first glance appeared impossible to answer it would have been better and certainly kinder to have let him go in peace this however i was in honour bound not to do he was nicholas property whose servant i also was and if it were possible to keep him alive i knew i must do it oh dr ingleby surely he cannot be dead cried the girl behind me in a voice that had grown hoarse with fear tell me the worst i implore you hush i answered but without looking round you must be brave he's not dead nor will he die if i can save him and turning to the steward who was still with us i bade him hasten to my cabin and bring me the small bag he would find hanging upon the peg behind the door when he returned with it i took from it one of the small bottles it contained the contents of which i had been directed by nicola to use only in the event of the case seeming absolutely hopeless the mixture was tasteless odourless quite colourless and of a liquidity equal to water i poured the stipulated quantity into a spoon and forced it between the old man's lips somewhat to my surprise for i must confess after what i had seen of nicholas power a few nights before i had expected an instantaneous cure the effect was scarcely perceptible the eyelids flickered a little and then slowly closed a few seconds later a respiratory movement of the thorax was just observable accompanied by a heavy sigh for upwards of an hour i remained in close attendance upon him noting every symptom and watching with amazement the return of life into that aged frame from which i began to think it had taken its departure for good and all once more i measured the quantity of medicine and gave it to him this time the effect was more marked at the end of ten minutes a slight flush spread over the sunken cheeks and his breathing could be plainly distinguished when after a third dose he was sleeping peacefully as a child i turned to the girl and held up my hand he will recover i said you need have no further fear the crisis is past she was silent for a few moments and i noticed that her eyes had filled with tears you've done a most wonderful thing she answered and have punished me for my rudeness to you on deck how can i ever thank you by ceasing to give me credit to which i am not entitled i replied i fear a little brusquely this medicine comes from dr nicola and i think should be as good a proof as you can desire of the genuineness of his offer and of his ability to make your grandfather a strong and hearty man again i will not doubt him any more she said and after that having made her promise to call me should she need my services i bade her good night and left the cabin meaning to retire to rest at once the stuffiness of my berth however changed my intention after all that had happened it can be scarcely wondered that i was in a state of feverish excitement in love with my profession as i was 
it will be readily understood that i had sufficient matter before me to afford me plenty of food for reflection i accordingly filled my pipe and made my way up to the deck once there i found that the appearance of the night had changed the moonlight had given place to heavy clouds and rain was falling the steamer was rolling heavily and every timber groaned as if in protest against the barbarous handling to which it was being subjected stowing myself away in a sheltered place near the alleyway leading to the engine room i fell to considering my position and it was a curious one i do not think any one who has read the preceding pages will doubt a more extraordinary one could scarcely be imagined and what the upshot of it all was to be was a thing i could not at all foresee having finished my pipe i refilled it and continued my meditations at a rough guess i should say i had been an hour on deck when a circumstance occurred which was destined to furnish me with even more food for reflection than i already possessed i was in the act of knocking the ashes out of my pipe before going below when i became aware that something i could not quite see what was making its way along the deck in my direction under the shadow of the starboard bulwark at first i felt inclined to believe it was only a trick of my imagination but when i rubbed my eyes and saw that it was a human figure and that it was steadily approaching me i drew back into the shadow and waited developments from the stealthy way in which he advanced and the trouble he took to prevent himself being seen i argued that whoever the man and whatever his mission might be it was not a very reputable one closer and closer he came was lost to view for an instant behind the mainmast and then reappeared scarcely a dozen feet from where i stood for a moment i hardly knew what course to adopt i had no desire to rouse the ship unnecessarily and yet for the reasons just stated i felt morally certain that the man was there for no lawful purpose however if i was going to act at all it was plain i must do so without loss of time fortune favoured me i had scarcely arrived at this decision before the chief engineer whose cabin looked out over the deck turned on his electric light a broad beam of light shot out and showed me the man standing beside the main hatch steadfastly regarding me before he could move i was able to take full stock of him and what i saw filled me with amazement the individual was a chinaman and his head presented this peculiarity that half his left ear was missing as i noted the significant fact to which i have just alluded the recollection of nicola's letter flashed across my mind in which he had warned me to keep my eyes open for just such another man could this be the individual for whom i was to be on the lookout it seemed extremely unlikely that there could be two mongolians with the same peculiar deformity and yet i could scarcely believe even if it were the same and had he any knowledge of my connection with nicola he would have the audacity to travel in the same ship with me it must not be supposed however that i stayed to think these things out then the light had no sooner flashed out upon him and revealed his sinister personality than the switch was turned off and all was darkness once more so blinding was the glare while it did last however that fully ten seconds must have elapsed before my eyes became accustomed to its absence when i could see the man had vanished and though i crossed the hatch and search not a sign of him could i discover whoever he is i said to myself he has at least the faculty of being able to get out of the way pretty quickly i wonder what but there what's the use of worrying myself about him he's probably a fireman who has been sent aft on a message to the steward and when i see him in the daylight i shall find him like anybody else but while i tried to reassure myself in this fashion i was in reality far from being convinced in my own mind i was as certain that he was the man against whom nicola had warned me as i could well be of anything the chief engineer at that moment stepped from his cabin into the alleyway here i thought to myself was an opportunity of setting the matter once for all i accordingly accosted him i had been introduced to him earlier in the day by the captain so that he knew who i was that's not a very pretty fireman of yours i began the chinaman with half an ear missing i saw him a moment ago coming along the deck here where does he hail from the chief engineer who i may remark en passant was an abedonian consequently slow of speech hesitated for a moment before he replied that's mighty queer he said at length you're the second man who's seen him in the night do you tell me you saw him this minute 
and if i may make so bold where might that have been only a few paces from where we are standing now i answered i was smoking my pipe in the shelter there when suddenly i detected a figure creeping along the shadow of the bullocks then you turned on your electric and the light fell full and fair upon his face i saw him perfectly there could be no doubt about it he was a chinaman and half his left ear was missing the engineer sucked at his pipe upwards for half a minute mm, queer queer he said more to himself than to me tis very queer twas my second in yonder was saying he met him at eight bells in this alleyway and yet i've been officially acquainted there's no such person aboard the ship but there must be i cried don't i tell you i saw the man myself not five minutes ago i would be willing to go into a court of law and swear to the fact didn't he swear he answered i'll nay misdoubt your word with this assurance i was conducted forthwith to the chart room where we discovered the skipper stretched upon his settee snoring voluminously do you mean to tell me that you really saw the man he inquired when my business had been explained to him i assured him that i did mean it i had seen him distinctly well all i can say is it's the most extraordinary business i've ever had to do with he answered the second engineer also says he saw him directly he told me i had the ship searched but not a trace of the fellow could i discover we'll try again leaving the chart room he called the boatswain to him and accompanied by the chief engineer and myself commenced an exhaustive examination of the vessel we explored the quarters of the crew and the firemen forward the galleys stores and officers cabins in both alleyways and finally the saloon aft but without success not a trace of the mysterious mongolian could we find the skipper shook his head i don't know what to think about it he said i knew that meant that he had his doubts as to whether i had not dreamt the whole affair the inference was galling and i bade him good night and went along to my cabin i wish i had said nothing at all about the matter nevertheless i was as firmly convinced that i had seen the man as i was at the beginning in this frame of mind i prepared myself for bed before turning into my bunk however i took down the small bag in which i kept the drugs nikola had given me and of which he had told me to take such care i was anxious to have them close at hand in case i should be sent for by donna consuelo during the night to assure myself they had not been broken by the rolling of the ship i opened the bag and looked inside my astonishment may be imagined on discovering that it was empty the drugs were gone End of chapter three